Good morning. I will be reading from the New King James Version, Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 21. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. When they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to you, came to Asia, a manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, it is certainly good to be here before you this morning and to have this opportunity to bring the lesson this morning. I'm humbled always to have this opportunity and I appreciate the confidence that the elders have in me to afford me of this opportunity. This morning, our lesson is going to be taken from Paul's address to the Ephesian elders at Miletus. But I want to, before we get into the meat of the lesson, to go back and establish some fundamental principles so that we can best glean these important lessons that we can gain from this inspired address to the Ephesian elders at Miletus. Now, it's important to remember here that in this particular lesson, uh, I will not be tackling at length the verses that you might have anticipated that I would be focused on, which is Acts 20, 28 to 31. I believe that there is much meat to chew on, if you will, from this lesson beyond those critical verses as well. And so that's what I wanna dive into this morning. But I wanted to remind us this morning that as God's creation we are truly blessed from womb to tomb, if you will. In fact, from the very point of conception, God knows his creation. And I wanna turn to you a couple verses, show you a couple verses here. Uh, in Matthew chapter 18, if you turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 18, You'll notice that uh, I didn't have an outline this morning or slides, but I wanted to encourage everyone to open your own Bibles this morning and turn, turn with me to these verses. And it is my prayer that uh, I will use these verses in their proper context. And if, if there's any difference with anything that I say this morning, as our brother Stan often says, you will be my friend if you reach out to me and we can open the word of God together. In Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse number one, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and notice verse three, and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little uh, become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so we can glean from that verse that children, small children, babies in the womb and small children are completely innocent. And if by some chance those children uh, pass from this life, all those children are in paradise awaiting the final judgment and to will be in eternity with God in heaven. Let's notice Jeremiah chapter one. <laughs> J 
Jeremiah chapter one and verse number five. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctify you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. That's God speaking of uh, Jeremiah. But the same is true for all his creation. Remember in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God made us in his image. In his image, he created them, both male and female, he created them. I mean, uh, they created them. Now let's turn to Psalms. 129, Psalm 139, and verses 13 and 14. For you formed me, you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. So we've established here that uh, we're born, we're precious in God's sight. And until we reach the, the age of accountability, we're perfectly innocent. And so it is important to understand that children aren't born in sin as, as the false Calvinist doctrine teaches, total depravity. And so it is a fact, however, that when we reach the, the cage of accountability, that we will all fall short of the glory of God. We will sin, we will not live sinlessly perfect lives. However, God has provided a remedy for that in that he has provided salvation in his son, Jesus the Christ. And there's no other name under heaven by which man must be saved. Acts 4, verse number 12, 1 Corinthians 3, 11. And so for those who hear the word of God, believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, are willing to repent of their sins and confess Jesus as the Christ, and are, and are willing to put him on in baptism, then the Lord adds you to his church. And so it is, it is the case that we do not I do not have a church. You do not have a church. None of us join a church. Jesus built the church. He promised to build it. And in fact, he did Matthew 16, 13 through 18. And Jesus is the head, is the head of the church, the body, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. He's the savior of the body, Ephesians 5, verse 23. He's the head of the body to the church, Colossians 1.18, and he has the preeminence. And so when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, as I just described, he adds us to his church. And so the church of Christ, the one church that we can read about in the Bible, is not just another denomination. It's the only church. It's the only church that you can read about in the Bible. And it's the only church where the saved are found. And so when we go out and tell people about the saving power of Jesus's blood and how his blood can wash us, wash our sins away if we meet the terms of entry into the church that I just described as we read about in the Bible, we're not trying to convert people to um, join our church because, again, we don't have a church. You don't have a church. I don't have a church. We're members of the Church of Christ. And it's not, as I stated, another denomination. The Churches of Christ 
is the only church that we can read about in the Bible. We say that in love. We don't mean to demean anyone, but the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 4 and 11 that we're to speak as the oracles of God. Now, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us that all scripture is inspired of God, literally God breathed. And so for the, for the Christian, we need to believe every word of the Bible is correct because the Bible is right. As an old preacher in the long ago said, you can fuss all night, but the Bible's still right. And so sometimes uh, I know some people have a Bible, uh, uh, a bumper sticker that says, um, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, actually, I would drop that middle phrase, God said it, and that settles it. Whether you believe it or not, God said it, and that settles it. And again, back to 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly or thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so as we get into our lesson this morning, we want to keep those thoughts in mind and I want to show you from the address this morning that there are valuable principles that would help us as members of the body of Christ to live the life that God would have us to live. Because in this address, we're going to see that Paul's manner of life created such a good example that it led others to have the same desire to follow Christ. And so, yes, Paul was an apostle. Yes, he was inspired of God, but his manner of life was also a powerful example to those around him. And he had a great influence. And we can, while we don't have uh, the miraculous gifts like the apostle Paul, and we know that the era of the era of miracles ended with the completion of the Bible in the first century. We don't have miracles today, but we do have the completed word of God. And if we allow that word to sink into honest hearts, then we can also have set and live by our manner of life, the same powerful example as men like Paul did in the, in the first century. So let's turn to our text in Acts chapter 20 and beginning in at verse number 17. From, my, from, my Leta, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, and so here we see that Paul had sailed past Asia, past Ephesus, and was waiting at Miletus and called for the elders because Paul probably thought that he might get bogged down in Ephesus with the brethren because Paul's intent was to make it to Jerusalem uh, in time for um, the, the, uh, the Passover. And so, uh, and so Paul uh, called for the elders here um, and, and when they had come, he began to address them. Now, why did they come? They came because Paul was uh, a, a, a person who had spent time with them. He had taught at the school of Tyrannus. Uh, for two years, he had been in Ephesus in Asia for three years, and um, and so they had great respect for Paul. Uh, so they came to him, uh, even though it wasn't just a 
around the corner kind of a journey. There was, there, and in those days, obviously they would, they would have either um, traveled by uh, uh, foot or maybe donkey or perhaps even, uh, you know, uh, ship. Um, that um, I'm not. They, the Bible's not silent on how they actually traveled, but it would not have been just around the corner trip. For the, for the elders to come to him. So that shows that they obviously had uh, some uh, respect for Paul's authority. Now, uh, we can see that they also would have had respect for Paul's authority because when Paul was with them, the word that he spoke to them was confirmed by miracles and also uh, by reasoning from the scriptures. Uh, let's turn to Acts chapter 19. Uh, and verse number eight. I'm sorry. When I uh, I mentioned earlier, I said the Passover. I my my mind was a uh, my mind was a little off here. I meant to say he wanted to be in Jerusalem in time for the the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is why he sailed past uh, Ephesus and went on to um, Miletus. So I uh, correct myself there. But let's go back to Acts chapter 19, and I want to show how Paul confirmed the word. That he was speaking as being from God by miracles and also by reasoning uh, from the scriptures. Let's look at uh, begin down at verse number eight, Acts chapter 19. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly, speaking of Paul, for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way, before the multitude, he departed from them and, and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or uh, handkerchiefs or aprons were bought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the ir evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish uh, exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, we exercise you by the by by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, "Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you?" Then the man in whom the evil spirit was was leaped on them overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified and many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic bought their books together and burned them in the sight of all and they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver so the word of the lord grew mightily and prevailed so we can see here that paul by reasoning and by miracles confirmed that the word that he spoke was from god and so today we can know that the completed Bible that we have 
is likewise from God. Now let's also notice uh, because of Paul's manner of life in the verses that were read that were read for us this morning, Paul said that he uh, in verse number 19, Acts chapter 20, verse number 18, Acts chapter 20, verse number 18. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. Notice that Paul's, Paul could confidently say that he was consistent, that he consistently lived a life that was truly one that reflected his serving the Lord, his living for Jesus. And we're gonna see that, uh, that thought uh, developed as we uh, work our way through our lesson. For us today, how are we living that consistent life daily? Is our manner of life showing that we're truly serving the Lord? Not just when we're among one another, but when we're out in our daily walk. Look at verse number 19. Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. So Paul truly epitomized a life of service, and we can certainly all learn uh, from his example. <clears throat> humility. Now that's a that's an interesting word. I think sometimes. Uh, we have a, some uh, erroneous concepts of what humility actually means. The Greek word literally means to place oneself underneath. In other words, to consider others more important than ourselves. There's a song that we sometimes sing, and uh, I haven't heard it. I don't know if it's in our song book, but the way the verses progress is that it says, uh, all of self, none of thee, some of self, some of thee, none of self, all of thee. Meaning the progression that we should mature in terms of our relationship with God. We need to be living for him. Let's turn to Philippians chapter three, seven through 14. And let's notice some verses how Paul, to show how Paul truly uh, epitomized uh, humility uh, in his walk with God. Philippians chapter three and verses seven through 14. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. 
Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, Paul epitomized humility, and we can certainly learn from his example. Let's notice Philippians 1. Philippians 1, verse number 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And finally, Galatians chapter 2, in verse number 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And so we could see that Paul certainly, certainly epitomized uh, humility, and we can certainly learn from his example. Now, Paul was, as we see in the latter part of that verse, that he served the Lord with all humility and trials. So, yes, Paul indeed was acquainted with trials. In 2 Timothy 3.12, we learned that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus should suffer persecution. Oh, was Paul acquainted with trials and persecutions. Let's notice 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, and let's begin at verse number 22. Remember Paul said that with tears every daily uh, because of the plotting of the Jews. But we can just see here in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22 to 28, that Paul's life as a, once he uh, uh, converted and obeyed the gospel, as an as a, as an apostle, when he was uh, from that time forward, Paul was acquainted with trials for certain. Beginning down at verse number twenty-two, Second Corinthians eleven. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths of in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And we can read about uh, many of these many of these examples in the book of Acts. Uh, the one in particular uh, that comes to mind is when he said that uh, I was stoned. You can read about in Acts when Paul was stoned and then Paul got up and went into the city and continued to preach Christ Jesus. Verse number 26. I in journey, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides, notice verse 28, notice this, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. You know, that is so powerful because 
Paul had a deep concern for it because as you know, as an apostle, Paul was intimately involved in planting and starting many of these congregations or at least uh, those who uh, labored, labored with, with him, who he has sent uh, before him. And so Paul had a deep concern for the churches. And we ought to have a deep concern for the churches as well. We ought to have a deep concern for uh, our local congregation here at Rockville. Now let's turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. And notice this, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. So Paul, as an apostle, because he had revel, direct revelation from God, he was given a thorn in the fresh flesh so that he would not exalt himself, so that he would not get puffed up. Paul was a man like you and I, like uh, a man like we are. Uh, and so um, he, he, he was subject to the same temptations like we are. And so he was given this thorn in the flesh to, uh, to, to keep him humble, if you will, to keep him from being puffed up because he had direct revelation. And guess what? Here's the thing. We have the completed word of God. We have the completed word in the, the entirety of the Bible, the completed word. But we have to be careful about allowing ourselves to get puffed up with the knowledge that we have about the Bible. So we have to humble ourselves as well and not get not not be tempted by the knowledge that we have and use it in the in a in a in a in a manner that uh, would not be pleasing to God. We're not supposed to use the, the, the word of God in a in a in a in a destructive manner or in a manner to uh, put others down or be demeaning. We need to use the word of God in a loving manner, leading others to Christ, getting ourselves out of the way and allowing the word to do its job. Verse number eight. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches in needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Powerful, powerful verses. Time will not permit to go deeply into that text this morning, but certainly mark that in your Bible. It's certainly one that we could all benefit from coming back to. So Paul was acquainted with trials. He was a he was a very humble, and we can learn from his example. Now we see in the uh, our next verse of our text here, um, in verse number twenty, how I kept back nothing that was helpful. So Paul here indicates that he kept back nothing that was helpful uh, or profitable to the brethren. We ought to have that same attitude, right? Uh, sometimes I know it can be difficult for us. Sometimes there can be many emotions involved associated with this. But whether we're uh, interacting with a brother or sister in Christ or someone who's a prospect that we're attempting to teach or whether it's a mature Christian or, or, or someone who's uh, weak in the faith, we need to in love be certain not be certain that we not hold back anything from them that is profitable or helpful to them. Even if it may initially be difficult for them to digest or accept, it is the will of God that we not hold it back from them. And Paul could say to the Ephesian brethren that he has spent three years in Asia and he said he kept nothing back from them. Uh, that was profitable or helpful. And notice uh, the remainder of that verse there in verse 20, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly 
and from house to house. Now that's powerful right there. Paul taught publicly from house to house. <clears throat> Testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in 2 Timothy 2, 2, Paul said to his son in the faith, Timothy, what thou, have, what thou has learned, teach thy to faithful men, that they may be able to teach others also. We need to be teaching the word of God to those who we encounter. We need to be availing ourselves of that opportunity to teach others with the publicly, house to house, whatever the case may be, six foot social distance, mask, face mask, eye, eye protection, whatever the case may be, we still need to be about the business of teaching others the word of God. Paul was still steadfast and movable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. And we see that in uh, Acts, uh, I mean, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And we ought, to, we ought to be the same way. Be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for we know that our work is not in vain in the Lord. We see that here in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 to 24. Let's notice it. Acts chapter 20, 22 to 24. And see now, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things, notice this, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. We saw that in some of the earlier scriptures that we, lived, we read. So that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And that ought to be our commitment as well, right? We, 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 want to, we want to have that same commitment to run that race all the way to the end. Remember what Paul said, said in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8? Time will not permit for us to go over there now, but Paul said, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the race. There remains a crown of, crown of uh, life uh, uh, stored up for him there and for all of those who love his appearance. So all of us have that crown of life if we just remain faithful and continue steadfast uh, in running uh, that race. Paul, Paul then proclaims that he is innocent of the blood of all men. Now, Paul was a faithful watchman. He truly warned the people. Uh, and for, in your own personal study, uh, right in the margin there, uh, Ezekiel 3, uh, 16 to 21. Ezekiel 3, 16 to 21. For the sake of time, uh, we will not go there this morning. But uh, Paul warned the people and he... Uh, did not did not shun to declare to them uh, the full the uh, the full counsel of God. Now let's notice verse number twenty five. Verse number twenty five. No, let's uh, verse number twenty six. Acts chapter twenty, verse number twenty six. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. So you're going to go in your own personal studies and look at Ezekiel 3:16 through 21. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And so here, what Paul is saying, some some uh, translations will render that the whole purpose of God, right? And so the whole counsel of God is is the entire inspired the entire inspired record that we have in the bible today and, and when paul was preaching in the first century he was uh, had direct revelation and he was revealing to the first century christians 
what thus says the Lord. We're blessed today to have the entirety of the, the, the word of God. And so we too have a responsibility to declare the whole counsel of God to those uh, who we're teaching, who we're interacting with, whether that's brother or sister in Christ, or whether that's someone who we uh, are, are encountering or interacting with in our daily lives. Notice in verse 31, Paul says, therefore, and this is to the elders, but I would, I would submit to you that it's important for all of us as members uh, to, in verse 31, therefore watch and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. And so uh, Paul, realizes how important it is and he realizes that you know uh in verse 28 to, to 30 what would happen what the elders in particular would have to watch out for and i will just read that quickly but i will not park there because this lesson is not focused on that aspect of it but in verse 28 it says therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the holy spirit has made you overseer to shepherd the church of god which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you and not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. And so it is certainly uh, something that uh, is, a, is, a, is a mighty uh, responsibility uh, on our eldership and we need to, uh, support our elders and work with them uh, as they uh, work to shepherd the flock here. Paul also just demonstrated a strong work ethic and a Christ-like attitude. He talks about working with his own hands to provide for his necessities and for those who were with him. Let's notice Acts chapter 20, verses 33 and 34. You know, Paul was a tent maker, we read in scripture, and he labored so that he would not be uh, a burden to, to, to the many places that he was going in his missionary journeys. <laughs> and that's an example for us today, you know, uh, to, have a, to have a strong work ethic. I know Tom alluded uh, in his, in his message last week uh, about an article he read where, you know, talking about uh, redistribution of wealth and people getting handouts for doing nothing. But um, it is the case that God anticipates that, you know, if we're, if we have a capability to work, we need to work and we need to continue doing so. And God has blessed us all with certain talents. So not just to work in the kingdom, but we also need to work to provide for ourselves. Verse number 33, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or a pearl. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. So we see here that Paul had uh, a strong uh, work effort, work, work ethic. Also, Paul taught by example. When we work hard, when we serve in the Lord's kingdom, when people see us out and about and they see that we are truly uh, living for Christ and serving him dutifully, and that we're not a people who are uh, slowful in business or anything of that nature, that sets a powerful example. Look at, uh, look at Paul, what Paul said, the result of his laboring accomplished in verse number 35. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive uh, than to receive. And so uh, we can see from this lesson this morning that we can learn many, many powerful, powerful uh, examples. Uh, from this address to the eldership. 
I'm going to close this morning with uh, a quote from Helen Keller. And I think this epitomize, epitomizes the kind of Christ-like attitude we ought to have as we humbly walk with our God. And I quote from Helen Keller. I long to accomplish a great and noble task, but it is my chief duty to accomplish humble tasks as though they were great and noble. The world is moved along not only by the mighty shoves of its heroes. The world is moved along not only by the mighty shoves of its heroes, but also by the aggregate of the tiny pushes of each honest worker. If you're visiting us with us this morning and you and you would like to learn more about what God requires of us to be in a right relationship with him, uh, our brother Stan will come on at the end uh, of our worship service this morning and contact information for you and we'd be glad to study with you further. Uh, if anyone is in need of prayers at the end, uh, please let our brother know and we will certainly uh, pray for you. Before I close, if, we, if you would bow with me as we go to God in a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we pray, Father, that the message this hour has been edifying all. We pray, Father, that we might continue to study your word, that we might continue to make application to our daily lives, that we might learn from the powerful examples of those faithful servants in the long ago. Father, we're so grateful that you so loved us that you sent your son into this world to die for our sins. It's in his name we humbly pray. Amen.